been at least one prison early. Now, I was that kid. Uh, it wasn't that I wanted to open one on Christmas Eve. I wanted to open one like two weeks early. The 15-year-old, the can I just drive to school today? I know I don't have my license. I know I'm not legal. But what would it hurt? We're not good at waiting. Well, the disciples were not good at waiting. The Jewish nation was not good at waiting. They wanted a kingdom and they wanted it right now. They did not want to wait. In fact, the Bible says they thought that the kingdom of God should appear immediately. They were not good at waiting. But let me ask you, what do we do from the resurrection of Christ to the return of Christ? What do we do? Open your Bibles to the book of Luke chapter 19 and verse 11. And, and the Lord tells us exactly what we are to do while we're in this holding pattern, this waiting room. What do we do? Let's stand together and honor the reading of God's Word. We're in Luke chapter 19 and verse 11. And as they heard these things, he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem and because they thought that the kingdom of God should immediately appear. He said, therefore, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. He called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. But his citizens hated him and sent a message after him saying, We will not have this man to reign over us. And it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. And he said unto him, Well, thou good servant, because thou hast been faithful in very little, have thou authority over ten cities. And the second came, saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained five pounds. And he said likewise to him, Be thou also over five cities. And another came, saying, Lord, behold, here is thy pound, which I have kept laid up in a napkin. For I feared thee, because thou art an austere man. Thou takest up that thou laidest not down, and reapest that thou didst not sow. And he said unto him, Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Thou knewest that I was an austere man, taking up that I laid not down, and reaping that I did not sow. Wherefore then gavest not thou my money into the bank, that at my coming I might have required mine own with usury? And he said unto them that stood by, Take from him the pound, and give it to him that hath ten pounds. They said unto him, Lord, he has ten pounds. For I say unto you, that unto every one which hath shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that he hath, shall be taken away from him. But those mine enemies which would not that I should reign over them, bring hither and slay them before me. Our Father, we thank you for the reading of your word. And Father, just a casual reading of our text reveals the soberness and the seriousness of it. We pray, Father, for grace that we might being able to declare the truths of this parable. We pray for grace that we might hear it and receive it into our hearts with a spirit of gentleness. Father, you have a word for us, and I pray that today we will receive it. We pray, Father, for those who have never come to the saving knowledge of Christ. Father, we pray that today they might acknowledge their sin, turn from it, and believe on the Lord Jesus. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and you may be seated. In our context today, Jesus had healed a blind man and the blind man acknowledged that Jesus was the son of David. Jesus has encountered Zacchaeus and Zacchaeus has been born into the kingdom of God and the people that are following Jesus on his journey to Jerusalem, they are elated, they are overjoyed at the prospect 
that the kingdom of God is going to come. Now in their mind, the kingdom of God was not spiritual. The kingdom of God was all political. It would be a time when there would be peace and prosperity. It would be accompanied with great pomp and circumstance. To them, that was the kingdom of God. The king would institute a kingdom that would be like the kingdom David had. They totally missed the idea that the kingdom of God is within you. That before there is a physical, visible manifestation of the kingdom of God, you've got to experience this spiritual kingdom that is the new birth. As late as Acts 1-6, the disciples still asked the Lord, Will thou at this time restore unto us the kingdom? It has gone completely over their head. They are oblivious. They, they are blind to the reality that the kingdom of God is not just something that is natural. It is not something that is physical. It is not something that is political. It will be, but not now. They were missing that period of time from the resurrection to the rapture of the Lord Jesus. What do you do while we wait? While we're in this holding pattern, while we are looking and longing for the return of Christ what is it exactly that God wants from our lives notice what Jesus said occupy till I come this word occupy is used only by Luke and it is, a, it is a very unique word. It is a word out of the commercial world, the business world and it, and it simply means do business. What is it that God wants for you, from you while we are waiting for the return of the Lord Jesus? He wants you to do business for Him. There is no excuse. There is no alibi. God wants us to do business for Him while we are waiting for His return. In a word, God expects from His people to be faithful to Him. To help us understand that, he speaks a parable and he begins by saying there was a king, a nobleman, that went into another country. He's going there to take a kingdom unto himself. It will be a vassal kingdom. He's the king, but that is going to be part of his kingdom. So he calls all of his servants together and he gives them all about four months wages. And he says, do business while I'm away. Take care of my business. Take this money, make money. And you'll notice that the first one is called after the nobleman comes back, the king comes back. He has, he has more kingdom than he's ever had. And he calls now for an accounting. No, notice notice what, how the citizens responded to this king. The Bible says they hated him. In verse 27, it says they were the enemies of him. I believe this is a reference to the Jewish leaders. They hated the Lord. They, they would accept the Lord as long as he would be like David. They would accept the Lord as long as he would push out the borders of Israel. As long as there was power. As long as there was prosperity. As long as there was peace. They were willing for Jesus to be their king. But Jesus doesn't come promising peace and prosperity. Jesus comes and says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And the religious leaders hated him. They became his violent enemies. In our sermon tonight, Jesus goes into Jerusalem. It is his triumphal entry. And he comes into the city of Jerusalem with the shouts of Hosanna. Behold our king. And all the while the religious leaders are behind the scenes plotting his death. So the king comes back and he says, now I have given you responsibility how many of you know this morning that with responsibility comes accountability? 
God has given all of us something. God has given us time. God has given us treasures. God has given us talents. And you may think, you know what? I just praise God for all he's given me. All this, all this talent. All of these treasures. God has blessed me. And God has been good with me. And I would agree with you, dear friend. God is good to all of us. But with those blessings comes also responsibility. Accountability. So the king has gone to the far country. He's left his servants to um, invest. And notice what the Bible says in verse 16. Then came the first saying, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. Y'all know how much that is, don't you? That's a thousand percent. I just throw this out there in case you're not observant. You ain't going to make that kind of return today. I mean, it's pretty awesome, isn't it? A thousand percent return. So here's, here's a subject in the kingdom and, and he fears the king and, and he obeys the king and he's faithful to what the king says and, and, and he, he goes out and he invests the money and when the king comes home, he's able to say, I made you a thousand percent. Now notice the graciousness of the king. The king says you have been a good servant. Um, the corollary to this parable is in Matthew 25, beginning about verse 11. Matthew adds two adjectives, and he says, good and faithful servant. Do you, do you ever think about that? Do you ever think about that day when you will be standing before the Lord? And all of these blessings He's given you, and all of these gifts He's given you, you will be called to give an account on how you used what God gave you. In that day, what, what do you suppose you will hear? Oh, and by the way, in that day, it will be irrelevant how much money you made in your lifetime, it will be very relevant how much you invested in the kingdom work of God. In that day, it will be very irrelevant how great a talent you had, but what will matter in that day, did you use it for God? You see, there's a day coming, a time we know not when, a place we know not where, when all of us will stand before God and we will give an account to God based on what we have done. He has given us time, talent, and treasure. Have you used it for God? Notice what, what the king said to this guy. He's made a thousand percent uh, on, on the king's money and the king said, I'm going to give you the authority to rule over ten cities. Now follow me. He was good and faithful. Two adjectives to describe this servant. Good and faithful. Keep that in mind. Good and faithful. I'm coming back to it. Good and faithful. And I'm going to give you ten cities. They're yours. You rule over them. You have a position of responsibility. You see, he has passed the test. He has done well. He has been faithful. He has obeyed what the king wanted him to do. The king said, occupy till I come. Do business till I come. And that is exactly what he did with no idea that the king would reward him with rulership. But he does. Then the next servant comes, you see that in verse, in verse 18, and, and he says, I have gained uh, five pounds. That's a 500% return. By the way, you're not going to get that either. And the king says to him, you have been a good servant. I'm going to give you five uh, cities over which you will rule. Now you see a pattern developing, don't you? They're given a responsibility and then there's the time of accountability. And then there is the time of reward. And by the way, there's a difference between blessings and rewards. Blessings are not based on what you do. Blessings are based on the grace of God. He makes it to rain on the just and the unjust. But rewards, that's very much dependent upon what you do. If you don't work, you don't get a reward. Ten pounds, five pounds, both were faithful and both were rewarded. Both were given a position to rule over ten cities, five cities. But there's another servant. Notice what the Bible says. Uh, he says in verse 20, he says, I've kept laid up 
in a napkin. What you left me to invest, what you wanted me to do is do business while you were away, but uh, uh, I kept it in a napkin. The word that is used there was uh, for napkin was a piece of cloth that they would wear uh, on the back so as to prevent their, there were no redneck juice. So they, they protected uh, so they wouldn't get burned on the neck. And he said, I, I kept it in a napkin. Josephus, the Jewish historian, says that one of the safest things people did with their money was to bury it. One of the most um, uh, absurd things they would do is put it in a napkin. Uh, this piece of cloth. Now, he got the same that everybody else got. He heard the same command that everybody else heard. But he said, I, 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 I didn't invest it. I didn't put it in a bank so you could get usury interest off of it. I, I didn't uh, put it in the bank. I, I didn't bury it in the ground. He said, I just kept it in a napkin. So he's being unfaithful. He's not doing what the king said to do. But not only is he being unfaithful, he's being unwise. It's just in a napkin. But have you ever noticed this, how we always have an excuse for our disobedience? Uh, we do, don't we? We can, all, we can alibi anything. One of the attorneys in my church told me one time, he said, uh, uh, I'm convinced of this, that a man can kill his own mother and convince himself he did the right thing. We can disobey God. We can, we can live any way we want to live. We can, we can, uh, we can uh, waste our time, waste our money, waste our talent. And at the end of the day, feel good about it because we feel justified in our disobedience. Well, here's this servant. Here's his excuse. He said, I know, I know you said take this money, invest it, do business. But he said, I just wrapped it up in a cloth. Because thou art an austere man. The idea there is you are a hard man. You're an unreasonable man. You, you're hard to get along with. There is no pleasing you. And he said, because I feared that, because I feared that you were an austere man, I just didn't do anything. I'm justified in my unfaithfulness because it's your fault. I know the kind of man you are. Look up here. He's lying. This man lied to cover up his unfaithfulness. How do I know he's a liar? Because what had the king just done for the other two men? In light of their faithfulness, what did he do? He gave them rulership. That was an act of grace. So when he says that this king is cruel, he's harsh, he's hard, he's unreasonable, he's not a good king, he's not telling the truth. By the way, let me ask you a question. What's your excuse for not using what God's given you? If I had a better home life, if I had a better job, if I had more money, if I had a better education, and on and on we could go with our alibis and with our excuses of why we're not being faithful to God. The bottom line is, and this parable teaches it clearly, that if you're not faithful with what you have now, you will not be faithful no matter how much you have. If a man is still a pat of butter from a cafeteria, he'll steal from his company. He'll steal that which is little, he'll steal that which is great. If you won't be faithful over that which is small and seemingly insignificant, you won't be faithful no matter what God does. Because faithfulness has nothing at all to do with the intrinsic value of a thing. Faithfulness has everything to do with the condition of the heart. And so here's this third guy and he says, well, you know, really it's your fault. You're, you're a hard man and that's why I didn't do anything. And, and notice what, how the Lord referred to him. Look at it in verse 22. The Bible says, out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, thou wicked servant. Uh, based on the conclusion of this parable, let me make this statement. There are only two kinds of servants that God sees. There are those good and faithful servants and there are wicked servants. Which one would you happen to be? Well, I'm somewhere in between. You know, that kind of servant's just not mentioned in the Bible. 
Well, I don't much like that. It really doesn't matter whether we like it or not. Either you're a good and faithful servant or you're a wicked servant. There is no in-between. Which one would you be? See, we're all going to stand before the Lord. And He's giving you this talent. He's giving you this opportunity. He's giving you this amount of money. He has blessed you. He has conferred. He has deposited into your life all of these different things. And then one day we will stand before Him and He will ask us about this. And we may say that you're a hard man. You're a hard God. We just can't please you. And the Lord will say, Thou wicked. Have you ever thought about what you will hear when you stand before the Lord? Have you ever given that any thought? Uh, by the way, standing before the Lord is not an time, a time for excuse. Standing before the Lord, He talks, we're judged. We don't do the talking. He does. If the judgment were held today, would you hear the words good and faithful? Or would you hear the word wicked? It's not an issue about whether or not you're going to be judged. You're going to be judged one way or the other. You'll be judged. You're going to give an account of everything that God has entrusted to you between the resurrection and the rapture. What are you doing? Are you occupying? Are you serving? Are you working? Are you doing business for God? And he says, this is a wicked servant. Now let me say this. Because this servant didn't know who the master was. He said he's an austere man. He wasn't. And because he's referred to as a wicked man, a wicked servant, I'm inclined to believe he's lost. He doesn't know the Lord. You say, well, if he didn't know the Lord, what was he doing being a servant? Well, what was Judas doing being a member of the first church? You see, there, there, are, there are imposters. There are interlopers. There are those who play the part and would have everybody around them to believe, oh, I'm a servant of the Lord. I mean, just look at me. I'm using my talent. I'm, I'm using my, my treasures. I'm using all of these things. I'm involved in the kingdom of God. But the bottom line is, they don't know the king. They have a wrong estimation of who he is. And so this servant is judged. And God says he is a wicked King. And he says, the least you could have done, verse 23, is put my money in the bank and got a little interest. You didn't even do that. This wicked servant is on the horns of a dilemma. The wicked servant is in a piccadilly. He's in a, he's in a bind. Because he says, you are a hard master. If he really believed that, you know he wouldn't have just kept the money in a napkin. He would have done something. Again, he's lying. What happens to wicked servants? Verse 24 says, Take from him that hath a pound and give it to him that has ten. And they said unto him, Lord, he has ten pounds. They're arguing with the Lord. They're, they're arguing, well, Lord, I wouldn't do it that way. I, did, did you see anywhere in the text where the king asked the servants what they thought he ought to do? And dear friend, in the day of judgment, my opinion won't matter. Yours won't matter. What the Catholic Church says won't matter. What your denominational leader says will not matter. When we stand before the Lord, He's the judge, the sovereign judge of the universe. And what He says goes. Period. But I can also tell you that he is a righteous judge. Everything he does is right. It is holy. It is good. But now no, no, notice that, that everyone that hath uh, shall be given. And from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. Well, how can you take away something that's not there? I think he's talking about potential. Here's a man that had the potential to invest, to do business, to live a faithful life. But he missed it all. In the Old Testament, there's a guy mentioned David is putting his cabinet together. He has won the victory. He's been anointed as the king. And, and he's putting his cabinet together. And he comes to an old man by the name of Barzillai. And he says, Barzillai. 
Won't you come join my cabinet? Barzillai says, ah, this is too far. David comes at him again and Barzillai says, I'm too old. Ladies and gentlemen, the life of Barzillai could be summarized with a question. What could have been? That may summarize your life. What could have been? If you viewed everything you have as God's, not yours. If you had viewed the time that you have, not as your time, but as God's time. If you had viewed all of the wealth that you have as God's and not yours. If you had used it all and done business for God, occupied till he come, what could have been in your life? But instead, you may stand before the righteous judge of heaven and hear the plaintive words. You're not a good and faithful servant. I'm closing with the last thing. Notice at the beginning of the parable, the Bible says that that they hated him and they sent after him and said, we will not allow you to rule over us. And then you come to verse 27 and he says, but those mine enemies bring them hither and slay them before me. In Matthew's corollary account in the 25th chapter, Matthew says they are cast into outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing, where the worm dieth not and the smoke is never abated, cast into outer darkness. I'm convinced of this. No child of God will ever go to outer darkness. Outer darkness is reserved for those who are finally impenitent. They never come to Christ. No child of God ever goes to outer darkness. What a loss. What could have been a life, a good life, and a faithful life lived in service to God, but instead they wasted their life, wasted their time, wasted everything that God gave to them, and now they're in outer darkness. I see tonight, today, a widow woman. Time has taken its toll on her body. She's tired. She's worn out. She's had to Fight all of her life to survive. But she's loved the Lord. She's lived for Jesus. She's used everything God's given her from her treasures to her time to her talent. She's used them for God. And then one day, death blows its icy breath into her face that is filled with wrinkles and she's carried into the presence of the Lord. I see another scene. It's a young man in the prime of his life, about 40. He's climbed the ladder of success. He has a new 4,000 square foot home, a new bass boat, a beautiful wife, and two beautiful young children. The sky's the limit for him. Church is not important to him. He comes when it's easy. He doesn't give on a regular basis just when his conscience starts bothering him. He's really unconcerned about the things of God and rarely does he ever lift his hands to God and thank Him for all that He's given. And, and tragically, he's carried to heaven. His life snuffed out at 40. Then the judgment seat of Christ comes. Both were saved. Here's this little old lady who didn't have much in life, but she gave everything she had in service to the Lord. Here's this man that was loaded, successful, respected, beautiful family. They stand before the righteous judge, and the righteous judge may say to this little humpback woman, I see here you only made $10,000 a year. But every time a visiting missionary came by, you gave what you could. Every time somebody needed a place to stay, 
you opened your home. You never started your day without first an open Bible and getting on your knees. Well done, good and faithful servant. The exact opposite is seen in this 40-year-old man. And the Lord says, you know, about the only time you cared about church was when your kids got old enough that they might need to be saved. And you only came when it was convenient and easy for you to come. You let ball games and family reunions and everything under the sun come between you and church attendance. And the church wasn't important to you. You never opened your Bible except when you were in a worship service, which was rare. You hoarded your money, refused to tithe on a consistent basis. You didn't care for me because you didn't know me. If you knew me, you would have cared. Depart, ye worker of iniquity. I never knew you. Now, which this morning had you rather be identified with? This wrinkled-faced, humpback old woman who had to scratch every day of her life to survive. Are the man that had it all until the judgment day. See, we're so bound by time. We, we, we want what we want and we want it right now. I'm convinced that's why people use credit cards. They don't have the money for what they want. But money's not a big deal. Just slap a piece of plastic down and you get instant gratification. Never mind, it's going to take you a hundred lifetimes to pay it off. But we want that instant gratification. We want what we want and we want it now. Friend, I'm telling you, you better live not for this world, but for the world that is to come. And that world is where we stand before Jesus and give an account for everything he's given us. I want us to stand together and bow our heads. This morning, if you've never been saved, we invite you to Christ. We invite you to put your trust and faith in him and be saved this morning. God loves you demonstrated his love by giving his son to die in your place. Would you come to Jesus this morning? Believe on him, the Bible says, and you'll be saved. You come. If the judgment were today, would you hear good and faithful? Or would you hear wicked? Do what God wants you to do. Be faithful over everything God's given you. Our Father in heaven, we pray now that as your spirit is moving in our presence, that Lord, we would not make excuses, that we would not come up with alibis, but rather, Lord, we would hear your Holy Spirit, that we would be submissive to him. Help us, Lord, to be faithful. In the small things, in the large things, faithful always. Father, we pray for those who are in need of Jesus. God, help them to come. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Oh.